Bill mentioned apartheid, because growing up in Hartown, Mississippi, for those hand me down books, you know, I was in apartheid. And I think that's really part of the reason that I began to look at education uh, early on. And I'm going to focus on Madison Prep because a lot of people in Madison are blind to the reality of what's really going on behind the scenes, who's finding it, and why. And I guess I'll start with something I read a few years ago about Milton Friedman and a statement he made in 1954, I think it was, that public education should not be a monopoly of the government, but public enterprise. So that should make one think. So when the first proposal came to MLSD, I looked at it and right away I said, this is not going anywhere because of Title IX. It was first proposed to be an African American, all but male school which wouldn't fly. It morphed from that to, I think, African-American Latinos. It went from that to a male school, charter school, where any kid living in the district can go. But it has a lottery system. It only takes so many kids. I think it's 60 in Star Rift, and it increases over the years. But when you look at the budget on it, what it is now, since it morphed from being an all-male school for all people in the district, and that wouldn't fly because of discrimination to females, it then said, well, we'll open a female school, a girls' school, at the same time. When we're stressed in the budget already, so I think the tag on it was something like 27 million a year. So it's crazy. And what bothered me more was the way it was presented. Uh, I thought I was re-watching Waiting for Superman. Because all I heard was the teachers are paid too much. It's the union's fault. Nothing was mentioned about economic conditions of poverty. But this organization, the Urban League, I'll call it a name, it pushed this message that's a message throughout this country for charter schools. Everywhere they push it, they use the same message. What bothers me more is they use our people to do it in many cases. And in Madison, I think it's because it's a native son who grew up here, left, and came back and started pushing it. And he got a lot of people to bite on it without understanding what it's really about. A week ago, it was a secret, well, I'll say a closed meeting at the Urban League where the superintendent of the board agreed to this meeting where only two or three board members could be present with the DOJ present and facilitating. So I said, I wonder why the DOJ got involved. Then I said, wow, DPI just put a hole on the grant. So if DOJ was interested in discrimination in schools, don't you think they would have been looking into what's happening in Milwaukee? No, I think it wasn't a coincidence that the DOJ was here. I think they were requested, even though the Urban League said, no, we, we didn't request them. But the agent said during the meeting that night that he was glad to honor the request. We didn't request them. So I feel that this happened as a way of intimidating a school board or intimidating DPI 
Because very few people, matter of fact, I think I'm the only one that's been going to the school board for the last eight years that I know of. I started out going shortly after the No Child Left Behind Act was passed. I went then because I saw and I know what the military do in schools. And a good example is what happened in Chicago to the schools when Mr. Arne Dockin was over the Chicago public school systems, where they had schools, public schools, that closed and reopened, not as just charter schools, but as military academies. I started ringing the bell at that time and trying to say at the school board meeting and anybody I could talk to that, hey, this is a threat to teachers and to the union. But very few people listen. When the eyes really opened was when Governor Walker came in with all his radical ideas. Then every union around was out marching against it. But the flag had been raised years ago, and we sat and did nothing. When I say we, I'm speaking collectively. So we go back to what Bill was saying earlier that it's not just the right wing or the unions, it's all of us. And if we sit and wait until it affects us directly, in some cases it might be a little too late. But I think at this time, we have time to turn this around if we follow the way Bill said we reframe it and go after it. And it's the only way. Agreements were made by the Urban League that they would take the military part of it out. I was asked the question early on. If you take the military JROTC out, will you support it? And I said no, because it's more than JROTC. It is killing public education. And I could see it coming back in 202, 203. So what's been happening, and I feel it, and I often say it at the board, and I don't mean to slam teachers when I say it, but I or to slam the board members. But I often say sometimes we make decisions that are politically correct rather than the decision that we should make that is correct. Last week at the board meeting, I was discussing with one of the supporters of the charter school. And we talked, and the question was asked me, why are you against it? And I gave numerous different reasons why I was against it. And this young lady said, well, I grew up in Virginia. You know, that's considered a southern state. And there is an achievement gap. I said, yes, I know. I'm very aware of it. And that's not the problem. That's not the question. The question is, is Madison Prep the silver bullet? Which I think not. Because when I think of the money that's coming out of the district and the children that are left behind, it bothers me, and it will happen, because all children can't go to that charter school. The other thing that bothers me is that when one say we have to get resources where we can in order to do what we want, I say, yeah, you get the resources, but you're not doing what's good, and if you can't get resources without selling your soul, you're getting from the wrong place. And you're not only selling your soul, but you're selling the future of your offspring. Yeah, I was appalled at that closed meeting that we had at the Urban League. When people were asked to leave because they were bloggers, or with the media. 
people that maybe the league weren't sure whether they were supporters or not, so they couldn't take the chance. They asked them to leave at the same time that they left people there that are known to blog and even publishing magazines that's allowed to stay. I raised that issue to school board. What was even worse, I believe, was the following day, last uh, Thursday, at the school board meeting. When I came in the building, it was a lady sitting there at a table with a stack of forms, and she handed me one. And I started to look at it. No, all you have to do is sign it. it it's already checked. It was check support for the prep school. So a lady standing next to her pulled her coat and told her, say, no, I've seen him here before. He's against it. <laughs> <laughs> and to put frost on that pumpkin, <laughs> this same lady was the first one called to appear and speak before the board during the public appearances. She went to the wrong place. She didn't even know where to go. And I have been harping forever and ever that. These meetings are stacked. They get people come in, some from the city, some are not from the city. But many of them don't know what's going on with the charter school, and I know that this lady didn't, because she was going on the stage where the board was sitting, instead of going to the podium where you go for your public appearances. <laughs> so, I said, we got work to do here, and I think we can do it. And I know that if we don't do it, that all of our children are doomed.